Rabbi, you ought to go to the hospital more often. <laughs> Man, if that's what they do to you. And just so you know, Pastor Earl had a stints put in a couple days ago, and he is doing just fine. He'll join us soon. And he's online right now. So you can you can say hello to him anytime you want. Pastor Earl, we love you. Well, we're at chapter 29. Uh, it's Paul's missionary journeys. And next week, uh, we pick it up at the end of his life. And then we're going to touch on the book of Revelation in a different way. So we've only got a few weeks to go. Hang in there with us. Today's chapter 29. But I think after that worship session this morning, um, I may change a few things. Missionaries are a different breed of people. They're different cats. And God made them to be a little different. In fact, I would even say as the world looks out at people and you know, has categories for everybody. I'll say missionaries fit into the the weird <laughs> category. <laughs> you've got to be you've got to be a little bit different to pick up and go to a foreign country that you haven't been to before. Missionaries have this something in them that says, I'll go anywhere, even if I don't know where I'm going, and I'll be part of a culture that I don't understand. But I've got a purpose no matter where God sends me. I'll venture out, I'll do new things, I'll expose myself to the unknown. And by the way, to some extent, we're all called to be missionaries. Somebody said, you don't have to cross the sea to be a missionary. You just have to see the cross. Once you see the cross, you're a missionary in your own hometown. But you don't have to be worried about it and go to some other foreign country um, Gosh, there's people who spent their entire life in continents that they had never been to before. But they ventured out and they tried something new. Now, you can always try something new. Break out of some barriers. Get out of some limits that you've limited yourself to. Uh, I asked Dennis to do the communion service today. And uh, uh, he, he looked at me, I think a farmer would say, like a cow at a new pen. <laughs> and he sat down and he says, well, I don't know. And I could tell he wasn't initially comfortable. I knew he could do it. Mm -hmm. He hadn't done it before. But I knew he could do it, so I just said, give it a day. Go pray. Dennis, thanks for calling me back, and thank you for stretching out. <laughs> and when people do stretch out, you notice at the end how, how he just got choked up at the end? He was just absorbed by the body and the blood of Jesus. And how personal that was when you say it in front of people. Uh, the first time you say it in front of people, it changes you. So, 
I think I might give you a, a little, a little personal touch of being a missionary. Kim and I went, were not only missionaries, but we both act in different ways. We both decided uh, we were going to sail to another country on a boat. Now, I know boaters. I know people who have boats in marinas and they visit on the weekends. And that's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about a breed of boater called the cruiser. And there's people who set out and they cruise just offshore or they cruise around the world. We never got more than a hundred miles offshore. But let me tell you, a hundred miles offshore, when you don't see anything, and when there's a storm, uh, you might as well be a million miles offshore. All the romance of being on a boat goes away very fast. Oh, Treasure Island is just around the next corner. We'll pull into a cove and it'll be nice. No, that didn't happen for a long time. But we did have a miracle every day. God was with us when we sailed. We weren't particularly good sailors, but we met weird guys who were good sailors. You know who the real sailors are? The single-handed guys? The guys who go around the world by themselves in their own boat, and their boat is rigged so one guy can do it? Uh, those really are strange guys. All the cruisers are strange in their own ways. But I would look out, I would watch for the single-handed guys, and uh, uh, William, For William Forsythe, Oh, William Forrester was one of those guys. He um, he was written up in magazines. He kind of lost his boat while circumnavigating, but he was on not too far offshore, and he was taking a bucket of salt water, and he was watching himself down, and then he put his hand to stabilize himself on a rail, uh, and the rail came loose, and William fell in the water, and his girl, his, his boat was called California Girl, and California Girl just kept going away. He had a, he was fishing, so he had a big lure, and he swam over to the lure, and he tried to catch it, and the lure, it was a big lure, and it stuck in his hand. And he still couldn't get back to California girl. The line eventually broke. Here he is, naked in the water, with a big fish hook in his hand, and he swam for nine days. He would swim to shore, uh, bury himself in some leaves, spend the night, get up, swim as far as he could to the next cove, pull in, do the same. By the time the fifth or seventh day came around, he was more delirious than anything else. And he claims that on that seventh day, he swam into a little cove and a man, an old man, was sitting on a log. And the old man said, uh, lie down behind the log, you'll be safe, and cover yourself with the leaves. And he looked up again, and there was no old man. So I learned some basic boat maneuvers from William Forrester because we happened to meet up with him on our cruise south. One day he told me how to handle a boat that was in a severe storm, how to, how to heave to, and how to shorten the, the head sail. Um, 
and how to turn the wheel aft over and create an eddy in the water. And we had a storm that night and it was a, it was a, a two, a two day, it was a three day, two night storm. And man, we looked at waves that were just 30, 40 feet high behind us. I was coming out from my watch. My watch is when I should have slept. I couldn't sleep at all that night because every third or fourth wave came in from the stern, picked up the boat and dropped it in the water. So I got dressed, put my safety gear on, walked up the companionway and I saw those waves. And I'm telling you, I knew, I know what fear is. And I, I know if I had to start praying and Kim was surfing down those waves, it was her watch. She was surfing down those waves and kind of enjoying it. I looked at the waves and I was terrified. She turned around for the first time and saw the waves and the fear hit her. If we would have let fear dominate us, we would have made terrible mistakes. We had to sing praises to the Lord. We were reciting scripture. I mean, it was all Jesus. Everything was Jesus. Let me tell you the secret of mission work. It's all Jesus. Every resistance, you've got to go back to him. Every storm, you've got to go to him. Every time you go to a new people, there'll be religion there, and that religion will try to stop you. But it's got to be all Jesus. You can't mess around with telling them about how to plant trees, except if you include Jesus and the Garden of Eden. But you better have you better have Jesus at the forefront of everything you say. And I just can't tell you what an adventure it was to be a missionary. Every day was like a miracle. Uh, I've got thousands of stories. And I thought of one as we were praising and worshiping here. Uh, we, lived, we lived in a 40 foot trailer and the trailer was on one side of this thatched roof and this patio. It was 40 feet by 40 feet. It was palm trees patched on top. It was really a cool place. We made it into a kitchen. People loved coming to our home. We hosted Thanksgiving up to 100 people one Thanksgiving, 125 and another. Uh, but one night, while Kim was in California, every fourth week, she went back to California and worked for a doctor. 70% of the patients were hers. He made him a truckload of money every fourth week of the month. And she came home with a truckload of money for us. I think one, the most, I mean, one, one time she worked 10 days, morning till night, 12 hours a day. She came home with $5,000. That was, that was her commission in one week. While she was gone, it gave me a lot of chances to do a lot of different things. And I was on the patio, kind of behind a sofa. And as I was praying, but I was on my face, prone, and I was before God, and I was having the time of my life. Then I heard five boys walk up my driveway. These were people from our youth group. They were 16 to 18 years old. They were the leaders of the youth group. And they said, Pastor, you know, I was a little embarrassed. I, I didn't want to get up, but they kept walking onto the patio, said, Pastor Mike. And so I got up and they saw me 
on the other side of the sofa. And they looked around and they said, what were you doing? They said, well, um, I was praying. They said, well, how were you praying? Why were you, why were you behind the sofa? I said, I was on my face before God. You can do that and it's okay. And usually I just do it alone. And they said, could we pray that way with you? Picture it. Five teenage boys and myself, all in kind of a circle on our faces before God. Every one of those boys, I didn't know it, every one of those boys could pray. And man, did they pray. And they prayed for their families. They prayed for each other. They prayed for the community. They prayed for the church. They prayed for other youth groups. They prayed, and they prayed for salvation. They prayed for healing. They prayed for deliverance. I didn't know they could pray like this. Do you know, those five boys will never forget that moment. But it's a missionary moment. And there's a lot of those moments to be had. I want to draw your attention to how those moments begin. It says in, oh, and, and missionaries don't think the same. I mean, they think it's a cool thing to get beaten up for Jesus. So do you remember um, after Pentecost, after 3,000 were baptized, then there was a healed man. He was lame. God healed him. And then the apostles eventually were brought in to the authorities, and the authorities said, you will not speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, well, you tell me whether it's right to obey God or obey man. So they send them to jail. In jail, they're praying, and the jail shakes, a large angel releases them, remember that? A large angel releases them and gives them their assignment, their instruction. But I think they already knew. They didn't say, the angel didn't say, whew, I'm getting you out of here to, to save your hide. You better go home, you better run, you better escape. They said, no, go back in the street and tell everybody about this new life. There's a new way of life. In fact, they called it the way. They call it the way. Go back and tell people about this new life. Well, the authorities sent to the jail were to bring these guys back to court. And the report was, they're not in jail. All their shackles are loosed. We don't know where they are. And another man says, I know where they are. They're in the street and they're preaching Jesus to everybody. And they're telling everybody there's a new way of life. So they go get them, round them up again, and they beat them up. You know what they do? Here they are beaten and they all converge together and they're so joyful. They had the, the privilege of being beaten up for the name of Jesus. That's the thinking of a missionary. That's how missionaries think. Remember in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were preaching Jesus and a girl who made a lot of money for someone uh, in idolatry. They would, make, they would make their idols, sell them, but that girl 
was demon possessed. And after three days, after she followed Paul, he got fed up with it. I mean, she would say, these men know the way. Follow these men. They know the they're just mocking him. Finally, Paul had enough and he said, get the hell out of that woman. The demon left and these people lost their income. Now they stir up the city. They bring him before Roman magistrates. They ask him questions and they strip them and they beat them with rods until they were bloodied and sent into the prison. Send these guys, oh, not just the prison, the inner prison. That's the third level of prison. That's the coldest, the dankest, the darkest. So here they sit them down in the inner prison where nobody escapes. They sit them down against the wall. Their hands are shackled to the wall. Their feet are shackled to the floor and there's a belt around them. So the jailer says, nobody will get out of here. They're my prisoner. Paul and Silas at midnight with joy, they sang praises to the Lord. You gotta be a little weird to be beaten up and bloody and then have so much joy that you can sing and pray. And it says, everybody heard them. The jailer heard them. The people in the prison heard them. The people in the second level, the people at the first level, everybody heard them sing praises to the Lord. And then an angel came and shook the prison and all their shackles fell off. They go back into the shadows and the jailer comes and he can't find a prisoner. He knows you lose a prisoner, you die. He takes out his sword and he's ready to fall upon his sword right through his heart. That's how they did it. And then Paul and Silas could see from, from the darkness, they could see in some light what he was about to do. And they come forward and they say, don't do that. We're here. We're still your prisoner. Whatever you do, don't harm yourself. You know what his response is? Sir, what must I do to have that kind of faith that you would be a, you would be a willing prisoner, that you would sing to a, a, a God that I don't know, but you, and you would be joyful at midnight after being beaten? Give me that God. Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they simply say, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and your whole household will be saved. Then he took them home. His wife made a meal and he took water and cloth and oil and wine and cleaned them up personally and washed their wounds. And Paul and Silas says, well, uh, take, take us to our new home. Take us back to jail. And in the morning, in the morning, the magistrates figured out, these are Roman magistrates, they figure out overnight, Paul is a Roman citizen. They've got no right to beat him. And their paperwork is gonna go to the magistrates who they report to. So they say, well, just tell them everything's okay and they're free to go. Paul says, we're not going anywhere. We're staying here until they come and apologize to us and they hear the gospel. That's what he's up to. He's always preaching Jesus. How, how did it all begin with a man who was ready to kill anybody who believed in the Lord Jesus? Here's his report. Meanwhile, this is in uh, Acts chapter nine. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out threats and murmuring against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest to request letters 
from the priest in the synagogue at Damascus. So if he found anybody who is following the way, get that in your mind. It's the way. Jesus said, I'm the way. He means there is no other life but the way. Follow me, follow my way. So he was after letters to persecute anybody following the way that he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled, he was nearing Damascus and a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. His horse fell to the ground. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? He can see him and he certainly can hear him. Who are you, Lord? And he want, he knows whoever this person is, this person is the Lord of all. And so he calls him Lord, that's capital L. Lord, who are you? He says, I'm Jesus and I'm the one you're persecuting. Stop it. You know, he never, Jesus never says, Hey, why are you beating up on my guys? He never says, uh, how come you're doing this to the church over here in Jerusalem? He never says, uh, uh, how come you're treating Kim so badly? Uh, why, did you, why did you put Stanley in prison? He never, he never identifies persecution against you or me, we're his church, he's the head, we're the body, we're inseparable, and when someone persecutes the church, they're persecuting Jesus personally. Amen. It is personal with him. You are personal to him. Amen. You count, and he's not counting you as someone over here and him over there. He says, we're one at this, and what you do to one of my followers, you do to me. Saul, why are you persecuting me? My personal belief is, the Bible says, if any man kills another man, he's killing and destroying the temple of God within that man. And if any man, if any man destroyed the temple in another man, God will destroy him. I believe this, this was a last call for Saul of Tarsus. He either makes the call or he's checking out. Who, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm the one you're persecuting. Now get up, go to the city. So Paul got up from the ground. His eyes were closed with scales. He could see nothing. He was an unable to see for three days and he fasted three days and three nights at this home. Now, after three days, it says that there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, there's a man. He's at this location. His name is Saul. And I want you to go lay hands on him so he can see. Then I want you to baptize him. And Ananias said, you know, Lord, this is a bad guy. Uh, he's been persecuting your people. I think, I think this is one of the humorous stories in the Bible. Have you ever prayed and said to God, Lord, do you remember when God remembers everything except your sins? Those are washed away. But I do that. I've done that in my prayer life. I said, you know, Lord, do you, do you remember when? Then I stop and I realize that's a foolish thing to say. Or I'm giving God some instruction in my prayer. 
He doesn't need any instruction. I do. So Ananias here, uh, he says, don't you know this is a bad guy? Of course he knows he's a bad guy. But he also knows he's converted. And something happened to Saul of Tarsus. I mean, something drastically happens to Saul of Tarsus. This is just a, a miracle conversion. The Lord says to uh, Ananias, get up and go to the street called Straight. Enter a house that belongs to a man named Judas. And there's a citizen of Tarsus. His name is Saul. He's praying in a vision. He saw you coming. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man. He has done a lot of harm to your saints. Uh, and now he's come to get a letter from the chief priest so he can do more harm. The Lord says, you just go. This man is my chosen man. Many are called, but few are chosen. This guy was chosen. He's chosen. He is my vessel. I'm sending him to Gentiles, to kings, even to Israel, and I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my namesake. I will tell you, uh, the mission field is not necessarily very fun, but there's some kind of grace that God gives you that it's okay. For seven years, Kim and I were on wheels uh, or water. We, were, we either lived on a boat or we lived in an RV that we purchased. But for seven years, we were on water or wheels. Uh, let me tell you what that means in the term of showers. We got so used to frigid cold showers that really we, we just lost our sensitivity to cold water. And on a boat, when we were on a boat, what a relief. We had a one gallon sun shower. We put it on the deck the sun warmed it up, and we learned each of us got a shower, and we only had, we had to budget a half a gallon of water for our shower. You, you say, oh, that's not possible. I will tell you, it's possible. We did it. But you do things like that, but God gives you the grace for it. Now, God's going to show God's going to show Saul of Tarsus how many things he must suffer for his namesake. Ananias left, entered the house. He placed both hands on him. This is precious. His first words, brother Saul. Does, doesn't that warm it up right there? Doesn't that just say Ananias believes God he calls him brother, brother Saul. The Lord who you saw in a vision has sent me. He lays hands on him. He sees again. He left the house and he placed both hands on him and uh, he gained his sight, was baptized and was filled with the Holy Spirit. So Saul, was a disciple in Asia Minor. And immediately he began to preach Jesus. But he spent 12 years in Asia Minor. His church, he started at the church in Damascus, but his home church was the church at Antioch. And in Antioch, he spent 12 years. This this is so important if you want to be called to ministry. You do it in a church and you do it under the observation 
and the approval of the elders, the prophets, the pastors, the leadership of the church. You join a church, you get involved, and people will recognize the call of God on your life. So many people want to cut corners and just go do it their own way. In the mission field, we met plenty of people who cut corners, just want to do it their own way. Uh, several of them got escorted back to the border by the federales. So Paul began to preach Jesus. And after 12 years, this is what happened. In the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucas, the Cyrene, Manan, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, Saul, and many others. And as they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me the work of Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, and send them out. They're now being sent out by the authority of God, with the anointing of God, with the Spirit of God going before them, being beside them, their rear guard, over their head, <laughs> under their feet. They've got, they've got the Spirit of God to go. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean in three missionary journeys, uh, Paul and Silas and Barnabas and John Mark and the people that were with Saul, which included Timothy and many others, it didn't mean there were no problems along the way. Next week we'll talk about the problems along the way and the end of Saul's life. But what I did is I... I put uh, the first two missionary journeys in your hands. So you should have this, take this home, because as you read through the book of Acts, uh, this will take you journey by journey, first missionary journey, second, and the third one you probably have in your, uh, in your Bible already. So I want to leave you with a thought. The thought comes from a man named Amir. The word religion, Amir says, Amir is a major in the IDF. He's a Bible scholar. Uh, he's very well connected. He, under, uh, he understands what's going on with um, with Israeli, Israeli intelligence, uh, Rabbi, his, his website is easy to access. Um, I think you'd enjoy things he has to say. But the greatest enemy that Paul and Silas and Barnabas and the rest of them, the, and the greatest enemy in a community is this. The word religion does not appear in the Hebrew Bible. Not at all. Religion is a man-made thing. It's a way that man can create to somehow express his faith or his belief in some higher entity. But that word does not exist in the Old Testament at all. So there's no Jewish religion at the time. And of course, Christianity was never meant to be a religion. It's a relationship. Amen. Each of you are different, and each of you have your own developing relationship with God. But you are not called to enter into a religion. You're not of the Protestant religion. You're not of the Catholic religion. You're not of the high Episcopal or the high liturgical. You are in relationship with Jesus. 
It is a way of life that we live. In fact, the Bible says in Acts 9, 2, then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest to ask the letters for him in the synagogue of Damascus. So if he found any one in the way, that now he could arrest them. But not for a religion, for practicing a personal relationship with Jesus. They are Jews who now are, are taking the way. That's interesting because we may understand why Jesus said now, I am the way and the truth and the life. Ever since the Tower of Babel, men have but been trying to achieve religion and work their way to God. And it will never happen. It was never successful then. It will never happen now or at any other time. It does say about religion in James 1, 20, 1, 26 and 27, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, but not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God is not an organization or a belief to believe in. It's to visit the orphans, help the widows in trouble, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's really the only thing that the New Testament has to say about religion. You and I are not born to be religious. It's always the religious groups that have difficulty with someone having a personal, loving, and caring, and kindly spiritual relationship directly with God. You have that. We should all rejoice in the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That means he's the only one who can take us to the Father's house so that we may be there where he is. Religion, rituals, self-proclamation of righteousness could never do that. The reality is, and we have all sung it many times, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the chant of every missionary. Every missionary goes out in the world to tell the world nothing can take away their sin, only the blood of Jesus. We celebrate communion because his body was broken for us. Listen, the, the Bible says, not a bone of his was broken, but his body was broken. Let me put it a different way. His body was broken down. He didn't even look like a man on the cross after all he went through. His body was broken down for us and his body suffered physical pain for us. And on the cross, his last drop of blood was shed for us. That's, the, that's our mission. Whether it's near or far, tell people what can wash away your sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's real relationship. When you get that bold and you can say nothing but the blood to your neighbor, and you can say nothing but the blood to your coworker. When you get to the point where Jesus is the only subject, watch out, religion will be nearby, but don't be afraid. Religion has never prospered and saved one soul, but people are looking today to make sense of the world around them, and they're looking for local, missionaries as well as missionaries who go afar. I'm just going to mention uh, Jerry. I'm running out of time, Jerry, so I'm just going to mention this. Jerry Gutierrez will be 
a speaker at a, at a conference in Mexico. In fact, she's asked to speak. Um, you may not know this, but she is a natural missionary. I mean, her, she was born of parents who were missionaries. She gets mission work. Missionaries are pretty much, pretty much understood. I would say Jerry would be pretty misunderstood in this community and maybe even this church if we don't get this right. She's going as a missionary to represent this church. She's a speaker and it's building community in unity with innovation in the midst of a digital era. That means I'm going to challenge Jerry. If we can take our sermons and translate them into Spanish and send them to people in other countries where she goes and, and she's known and she goes into other countries, then we have a chance of building up people who, number one, are aware of what the devil is doing today in the world. That's our November to November theme. And then, secondly, we all begin to pray for the same things. Every message, every sermon, will have a little prayer list with it. From November to November, America for Jesus. Take back America for Jesus and do it biblically. There's something else. If you're born, like Jerry is born, to missionary parents, you become a lot like your parents. And her parents would help everybody. They'd help everybody. No matter how desperate it looked, no matter how down and out the people were, she would turn to her parents and she would learn to help even the least and the hopeless. Listen, we got some pretty hopeless people around here in Homeland. We got some people that everybody else has given up on. But Jerry doesn't give up. She just spent hours taking a young lady around uh, on Saturday trying to find a place for her to stay a safe place and a place to get her life back together. And people know this young lady and most people have given up on her. It's just not, it's just not in a missionary to give up on anybody, no matter how down they are. There's still somebody who Jesus died for. So don't be too quick. Don't be too quick to judge Jerry. If she's helping someone who you can't help and who you might have given up on. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at how persistent she is. Even when people take advantage of her, it's like she, she won't let that stop her. She won't get offended. And it's good to have somebody like that in a church. Even if it's only one person, it's a reminder to us, everybody, no matter how badly damaged, no matter how much damage the devil has done to another human being, there's somebody who still cares. They still need to eat today. They still need a cool cup of water. They still need some clothing. They still need some shelter. They still need some help because Jesus died. Now, let me conclude. 
late with this one thought. Jesus was the greatest missionary you and I can ever imagine. To come from heaven to earth is the biggest come down I could ever imagine. And he came to earth pure, sinless, spotless. How would you like to be the only one? The only one. It's like, well, where's my fellowship? There is no one equal to him. He came as a missionary with the purest heart to help even the most downtrodden. By the way, I look around the room. Some of you are pretty downtrodden. I know your life story. You've been hurt badly. But Jesus still pursued you. Missionaries do that. Rabbi, I hardly even touched my sermon. But if you would close us, please. Yeah. Lift, lift us high. Something special is happening all around this area. Mike said it. You don't have to say it. You know it. Something's going on here.